James and the Giant Peach, Chapter 3 It was at this point that the first thing of all, the rather peculiar thing that led to so many other, much more peculiar things, happened to him. For suddenly, just behind him, James heard a rustling of leaves, and he turned round and saw an old man in a funny dark green suit emerging from the bushes. He was a very small old man, but he had a huge bald head and a face that was covered all over with bristly black whiskers. He stopped when he was about three yards away, and he stood there, leaning on his stick and staring hard at James. When he spoke, his voice was very slow and creaky. "'Come closer to me, little boy,' he said, beckoning James with a finger. "'Come right up close to me, and I will show you something wonderful.' James was too frightened to move. The old man hobbled a step or two nearer, and then he put a hand into the pocket of his jacket and took out a small white paper bag. "'You see this?' he whispered, waving the bag gently to and fro in front of James's face. "'You know what it is, my dear. You know what's inside this little bag?' Then he came nearer still, leaning forward and pushing his face so close to James that James could feel breath blowing on his cheeks. The breath smelled musty and stale and slightly mildewed, like air in an old cellar. "'Take a look, my dear.' he said, opening the bag and tilting it towards James. Inside it, James could see a mass of tiny green things that looked like little stones or crystals, each one about the size of a grain of rice. They were extraordinarily beautiful, and there was a strange brightness about them, a sort of luminous quality that made them glow and sparkle in the most wonderful way. "'Listen to them,' the old man whispered. "'Listen to them move!' James stared into the bag, and sure enough, there was a faint rustling sound coming up from inside it, and then he noticed that all the thousands of little green things were slowly, very, very slowly, stirring about and moving over each other as though they were alive. "'There's more power and magic in those things in there than in all the rest of the world put together,' the old man said softly. But, but what are they? James murmured, finding his voice at last. Where do they come from? Aha, the old man whispered. You'd never guess that. He was crouching a little now and pushing his face closer and closer to James until the tip of his long nose was actually touching the skin on James's forehead. Then suddenly he jumped back and began waving his stick madly in the air. Crocodile tongues, he cried. One thousand! thousand long slimy crocodile tongues boiled up in the skull of a dead witch for twenty days and nights with the eyeballs of a lizard and the fingers of a young monkey the gizzard of a pig the beak of a green parrot the juice of a porcupine and three spoonfuls of sugar stew for another week and then let the moon do the rest all at once, he pushed the white paper bag into James's hands and said, Here, you take it. It's yours. Chapter 4 James Henry Trotter stood there, clutching the bag and staring at the old man. And now, the old man said, all you've got to do is this, take a large jug of water and pour all the little green things into it. Then, very slowly, one by one, add ten hairs from your own head. That sets them off, it gets them going. In a couple of minutes, the water will begin to throff and bubble furiously. And as soon as that happens, you must quickly drink it all down the whole jug full in one gulp. And then, my dear, you will feel it churning and boiling in your stomach, and steam will start to come out of your mouth, and immediately after that, marvellous things will start happening to you. Fabulous, unbelievable things, and you will never be miserable again in your life, because you are miserable, aren't you? You needn't tell me, I know all about it. Now off you go, and do exactly as I say, and don't whisper a word of this to those two horrible ants of yours, not a word. And don't let those green things get in the way from you either. 
because if they do escape, then they will be working their magic upon somebody else instead of upon you. And that isn't what you want at all, is it, my dear? Whoever they meet first, be it bug, insect, animal or tree, that will be the one who gets the full power of their magic. So, hold the bag tight. Don't tear the paper. Off you go. Hurry up. Don't wait. Now's the time. Hurry. With that, the old man turned away and disappeared into the bushes. Chapter 5 The next moment, James was running back towards the house as fast as he could go. He would do it all in the kitchen, he told himself. If only he could get there without Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker seeing him. He was terribly excited. He flew through the long grass and the stinging nettles, not caring whether he got stung or not on his bare knees. And in the distance, he could see Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker sitting in their chairs with their backs towards him. He swerved away from them so as to go around the other side of the house. But then, suddenly, just as he was passing underneath the old peach tree that stood in the middle of the garden, his foot slipped. And he fell flat on his face in the grass. The paper bag burst open as it hit the ground, and the thousands of tiny green things were scattered in all directions. James immediately picked himself up on his hands and knees and started searching around for the precious treasures. But what was this? They were all sinking into the soil. He could actually see them wriggling and twisting as they burrowed their way downward into the hard earth. And at once he reached out a hand to pick some of them before it was too late. But they disappeared, right under his fingers. He went after some others, and the same thing happened. He began scrabbling around frantically in an effort to catch hold of those that were left. But they were too quick for him. Each time the tips of his fingers were just about to touch them, they vanished into the earth. And soon, in the space of only a few seconds, every single one of them had gone. James felt like crying. He would never get them back now. They were lost, lost, lost forever. But where had they gone to? And why in the world had they been so eager to push down into the earth like that? What were they after? There was nothing down there. Nothing except the roots of an old peach tree. And a whole lot of earthworms and centipedes and insects living in the soil. But what was it that the old man had said? Whoever they meet first, be it bug, insect, animal or tree, that will be the one who gets the full power of their magic. Good heavens, thought James, what is going to happen in that case if they do meet an earthworm? Or a centipede? Or a spider? And what if they do go into the roots of the peach tree? Get up at once, you lazy little beast, a voice was suddenly shouting in James's ear. James glanced up and saw Aunt Spiker standing over him, grim and tall and bony, glaring at him through her steel-rimmed spectacles. Get back over there immediately and finish chopping up those logs, she ordered. Aunt Sponge, fat and pulpy as a jellyfish, came waddling up behind her sister to see what was going on. Why don't we just lower the boy down the well in a bucket and leave him there for the night, she suggested. That ought to teach him not to laze around like this the whole day long. That's a very good wheeze, my dear Sponge, but let's make him finish chopping the wood first. Be off with you to once, you hideous brat, and do some work. Slowly, sadly, poor James got up off the ground and went back to the wood pile. Oh, if only he hadn't slipped and fallen and dropped that precious bag. All hope of a happier life had gone completely now. Today and tomorrow and the next day, and all the other days as well, would be nothing but punishment and pain, unhappiness and despair. He picked up the chopper and was just about to start chopping away again when he heard a shout behind him that made him stop and turn. <laughs>